How foolish, Samuel exclaimed. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. Had you kept it, the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom must end, for the Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. The Lord has already appointed him to be the leader of his people, because you have not kept the Lord's command. Saul didn't wait, and by not waiting, disobeyed what he was told by Samuel, which probably came directly from the Lord. Samuel's now saying that his descendants aren't going to necessarily keep ruling over Israel after him. What's up, cool people? My name's Matt. Welcome back to our Bible study. Alrighty. So we're looking at 1 Samuel 13 now. And uh, basically Samuel has officially kind of stepped down as Israel's primary leader. He still is going to, you know, help teach the people and tell them, you know, what God wants them to do. But Saul is now kind of like actual primary leader, especially from like a military standpoint or, you know, other kinds of things like that, <laughs> that generally are better suited to someone of a younger age than Samuel. So, um, otherwise, there's not too much else to say, I guess. There was also mention of maybe some continued conflict with the Philistines or other things like that, but we'll we'll get more on that matter in this chapter anyway. So here we go. 1 Samuel 13. Saul was 30 years old when he became king, and he reigned for 42 years. Saul selected 3,000 special troops from the army of Israel and sent the rest of the men home. He took 2,000 of the chosen men with him to Michmash and the hill country of Bethel. The other 1,000 went with Saul's son Jonathan to Gibeah in the land of Benjamin. Uh, okay, footnote there at 30 years old. That's how it reads in a few Greek manuscripts. The number's missing in the Hebrew. Hebrew doesn't include, either it doesn't include his age, or like, you know, it could have been a damaged part of the ancient Hebrew text. But, it's reasonable to assume that Saul was at least fairly young. Um, and then it says he reigned for 42 years. Hebrew, uh, the number is incomplete in the Hebrew. So, yeah, that... That would tell me the odds of the Hebrew document being damaged is even more likely since there's both the 30 and part of the number of years that he reigned missing. But I, I'm guessing they got the 42 years then from the Greek manuscripts that they got the 30 years old from over here. So anyway, uh, Saul then selected some special, probably highly competent and uh, combat trained troops from Israel's army to, uh, pro well, presumably go deal with the Philistines or at least some of the fighting. Um, now, I think it was mentioned a couple of chapters ago that there were like 300,000 or so, you know, Israelite men fighting against the Philistines. So, <laughs> Saul has taken a much smaller contingent of them to carry out whatever operations are about to happen here. But anyway, uh, then we get to verse 3. Soon after this, Jonathan attacked and defeated the garrison of Philistines at Geba. The news spread quickly among the Philistines. So Saul blew the ram's horn throughout the land, saying, Hebrews, hear this. 
Rise up and revolt. All Israel heard the news that Saul had destroyed the Philistine garrison at Geba, and that the Philistines now hated the Israelites more than ever. So the entire Israelite army was summoned to join Saul at Gilgal. Now, uh, Jonathan was actually the one leading the, the garrison at Geba, but, you know, Saul, being his father, and also just the broader military leader, uh, he still kind of gets the credit for it anyway. But in any case, point is, they, they've had some victory, they've stirred up the Philistines, and so now they're preparing for an even larger scale attack. Or at least a larger scale battle. Whether or not they're initiating it. Ah, uh, then verse 5. Philistines mustered a mighty army of 3,000 chariots... 6,000 charioteers, and as many warriors as the grains of sand on the seashore. They camped at Michmash, east of beth Aven. The men of Israel saw what a tight spot they were in, and because they were hard-pressed by the enemy, they tried to hide in caves, thickets, rocks, holes, and cisterns. Some of them crossed the Jordan River and escaped into the land of Gad and Gilead. Uh, and I... Don't like it when they break a verse between paragraphs, but I'll just pause it there for the moment, I guess. So, footnote there. Uh, Greek and Syriac versions read 3,000. The Hebrew says 30,000. But we haven't exactly been told the age of the Hebrew text that they would pull this from. Um, hardly anything that is used in current Bible translation efforts is older, is any older than like 2000 years old, which would still be way, way after any of this is written. Um, there might be some documents that are older than that, but they would be much more likely to be severely damaged like we saw evidence of in the very first verse here but um yeah uh, so the philistines in any case got a large amount of troops i mean it says right here as many warriors as the grains of sand on the seashore aka too many to count. So, because there were so many of them, it just, like, they... Uh, I guess the Israelite troops needed to either find other ways to... Well, it says they tried to hide. Could have also been trying, you know, more guerrilla warfare type tactics where it's just like, all right... Let's spread out, maybe hide among some things and see how many enemies we can just sort of pick off. Rather than just, you know, your classic, all right, we've got the two sides and they charge at each other sort of thing. But, um, let's continue on because there's sure to be more on that matter. So then we'll continue on in the next paragraph, which is like halfway through verse 7. Meanwhile, Saul stayed at Gilgal, and his men were trembling with fear. Saul waited there seven days for Samuel, as Samuel had instructed him earlier, but Samuel didn't come. Saul realized that his troops were rapidly slipping away. So he demanded, bring me the burnt offering and the peace offerings. And Saul sacrificed the burnt offering himself. Just as Saul was finishing the burnt offering, Samuel arrived. Saul went out to meet and welcome him, but Samuel said, What is this you have done? And I'm actually going to pause there. So, the, the, the troops are 
kind of scattering. It's not looking great for Israel's armies right now. Um, and part of it is that Saul has been waiting on Samuel to make these offerings in order to, you know, have God's blessing on the their their battles. But it apparently has been seven days of waiting. Now, the the impression I get here is that Samuel told him to wait maybe up to seven days. In any case, the appointed time of waiting, it seems, had passed. Or at least was very close to its end. So Saul's kind of impatient, seeing what's going on around him, and decides, all right, well, if we need this blessing, then I'm just going to do it myself. But um, that clearly didn't sit well with Samuel. I mean, yes, Samuel, first thing he does is come up and ask, what have you done? Like, you were supposed to wait for me. Why didn't you wait? So then, continuing from there, Saul replied, I saw my men scattering from me, and you didn't arrive when you said you would, and the Philistines here are, Philistines are at Michmash ready for battle. So I said, the Philistines are ready to march against us at Gilgal, and I haven't even asked for the Lord's help. So I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering myself before you came. How foolish, Samuel exclaimed. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. Had you kept it, the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom must end, for the Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. The Lord has already appointed him to be the leader of his people, because you have not kept the Lord's command. So, it doesn't exactly say the timing of everything, uh, like, especially not quite the timing of this in relation to when Saul was first chosen as king. But, seemingly not that long after, although, or, or maybe it was the majority of these 42 years, I don't know. But in any case, that seems unlikely though, because Samuel was already old when Saul was anointed king. Samuel still being alive seems a bit unlikely at this point. But anyway, um, big picture though, Saul didn't wait, and by not waiting, disobeyed what he was told by Samuel, which probably came directly from the Lord. So basically, because of disobeying God's commands... Saul is now, you know, he is not going to be blessed with as long of a reign, I guess. Or at the very least, like, Samuel's now saying that his descendants aren't going to necessarily keep ruling over Israel after him. Because, I mean, when it, when it says... The Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. I mean, obviously Saul himself wouldn't be reigning over Israel forever. But it was kind of thought that their descendants uh, are, you know, continuing the same kingdom, the same rule. So, yeah. it Because Saul messed up here, though... It's not going to be his family that gets to rule over Israel for the long term. All right. Um, were there any footnotes in this section that I missed? Doesn't look like it. Okay. So then I will get a quick sip of water here. 
<clears throat> and then we will move on to verse 15. Samuel then left Gilgal and went on his way. But the rest of the troops went with Saul to meet the army. They went up from Gilgal to Gibeah in the land of Benjamin. When Saul counted the men who were still with him, he found only 600 were left. Saul and Jonathan and the troops with them were staying at Geba in the land of Benjamin. The Philistines set up their camp at Michmash. Three raiding parties soon left the camp of the Philistines. One went north toward Ophra in the land of Shul. Another went west to Beth Horon. And the third moved toward the border above the valley of Zeboim. Zeboim? I don't know, near the wilderness. Um, now I'm realizing it keeps mentioning Gibeah and Geba. Uh, that could be another one of those just Hebrew translation kind of things. They might actually be the same place. Because it was previously mentioned that Gibeah was in the land of Benjamin. And I think I'm actually remembering a footnote from some previous chapter saying that it is sometimes rendered as Gibeah, sometimes as Geba. But anyway, just thought I'd mention that to maybe help alleviate some possible confusion on that matter. But yeah, uh, so they had 3,000 troops at the start of this whole operation. Now they're down to 600 not looking good. Especially considering it doesn't mention any significant uh, damage that they've done to the Philistine armies. And now the Philistines are launching a multi-front attack. Uh, and footnote there, I just noticed. Uh, it's in Greek version. Hebrew reads, Samuel then left Gilgal... And went to Gibeah in the land of Benjamin. Rather than saying the rest of the troops met with Saul. Or went with Saul to meet the army. And they went from Gilgal to Gibeah. Hmm. So, I mean, it could be, at least in this particular moment, that maybe... Okay, but then it says here in verse 16 that Saul and Jonathan and the troops were staying at Geba in the land of Benjamin, so they certainly weren't still at Gilgal then. It, I mean, it's possible, I guess, that Samuel might have still went with them, but you wouldn't think he would after what just happened with the offerings. So, I don't know. In any case, they've got some real small numbers now, and things are not looking good. Yeah, they're looking even worse than they did before. Um. Alright, then we get to verse 19. There were no blacksmiths in the land of Israel in those days. Philistines wouldn't allow them for fear they would make swords and spears for the Hebrews. So whenever the Israelites needed to sharpen their plowshares, picks, or axes, or sickles, they had to be they had to take them to a Philistine blacksmith. The charges were as follows: a quarter of an ounce of silver for sharpening a plowshare or a pick, and an eighth of an ounce for sharpening an axe or making the point of an ox goad. So on the day of the battle, none of the people of Israel had a sword or spear except for Saul and Jonathan. The pass at Michmash had meanwhile been secured by a contingent of the Philistine army. And that seems like that's not the end of this whole conflict, but that's all we get in this chapter. Um, a couple of footnotes there. Hebrew says one pim instead of an ounce which translates roughly to 8 grams, or at least that's the estimate. Oh, uh, yeah. 
and I missed this one here. Uh, as in Greek version, Hebrew reads or plowshares, but it already mentioned plowshares, so maybe that would have read whenever they needed to sharpen their picks, axes, or plowshares. Uh, I don't know. Either way, any kind of metal tools that they would have had. Whenever they needed to get those sharpened, they had to go to Philistine blacksmiths because the Philistines weren't allowing the Israelites to have their own blacksmiths for fear of an uprising, basically. Or at least for fear of the uprising being better equipped. Um... Eighth of an ounce there says the Hebrew was a third of a shekel. Okay, so that was a quarter of an ounce. That was an eighth of an ounce. Gotcha. Um, so, at this point, the tools for battle aren't necessarily ideal either. In addition to the low number of troops and... Other things just not looking good. You wonder if any of this misfortune had to do with Saul not following God's directions and burning the offerings himself when he was supposed to wait for Samuel. I'm sure that played at least some part in it. But, um... Yeah, that's kind of where we leave things off for now. I guess there are s some other chapters that continue this, but we'll have to get to those some other time. All right, so, um, yeah, already not a good look on Saul as the main leader. Uh, of course, we don't know exactly how long he's been ruling at this point. I do know that there's still quite a while where he's alive and so is the next king so uh, it's not too absurd to think this is fairly early in Saul's reign but anyway um yeah things have taken quite a turn for the worse partially because Saul messed up and didn't wait for Samuel to do the offerings. But that's that's all that we've got for now. So, as always, like and share if you enjoyed the video. Subscribe to the channel and click the bell if you're on YouTube to get updates when I post new videos. If you're seeing this anywhere else, just give me a follow or whatever you need to do for that platform. You can look down in the description for info on other social media pages and places to find and follow me and keep up with what I do. And leave comments down below the video with any thoughts you have. So that's going to do it for now. Uh, hope you're all doing well. Hopefully I'll see you soon for another video. But whatever the case is, till next time, stay cool, people.